Kaya, hello. I respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional owners of the land on which we're standing today, the Noongar people from the Wujak Nation, as we make this presentation to our parents and guardians of our Year 11 students. Joining me in this presentation is Ms Julie Miller, Assistant Manager of Student Services and Pastoral Care Coordinator, and Mr Tim Dow, our Vet Coordinator. In this session, we'll cover uh, the points that are listed up on the board there, and hopefully at the end of the session, you'll have a clearer understanding of the pathway ahead for your young person who's now in year 11. So as I said, joining me today will be Ms Julie Miller and Mr Tim Dow. As you can see from the graphic, the road ahead looks fairly, um, fairly straight, a few bumps in the road, and we hope that following this presentation, the road ahead will look a lot more clear to you and your young person as they progress through their first year of senior secondary schooling. In senior secondary schooling, there are words and acronyms that we often use without due regard for whether our parents and guardians actually know what we're talking about. So here are a list of some of the acronyms that are often used in our description of senior secondary schooling. I won't read them all out, uh, but the uh, video will be made available to you so that you can um, see for yourself and refer back to them as you need to. So in order to understand the pathway ahead for senior schooling, it's really important that we look at what's the end result. As I've said on many occasions, you can't really go out and play a successful game of sport if you're not familiar with the rules. So senior secondary schooling is no different. There are rules. What we want to do is to be able to have a successful completion of senior secondary schooling for your young person. And what that means is in two years time, the students can actually be proud and wear the school sash. Not the mortar board, because we don't have those, but the school sash as a celebration of their successful completion of, of their schooling. However, the WACE, which stands for West Australia Certificate of Education, is not something that is afforded to all students who finish Year 12. That's what the piece of paper will look like. And successful completion of senior secondary schooling is the achievement of the WACE, which is often referred to wrongly as graduation. It's actually a Certificate of Secondary Education. So the majority of students, but not all, will actually be awarded that certificate because it's not something that's gifted to all people simply because they've sat in the school for two years in the senior secondary years. A study towards the completion of the WACE is actually open for a lifetime, so students can add to it after they finish Year 12 as post-Year 12 students. So that's the first piece of paper that a student could get and that's what we're hoping that your young person will actually achieve at the end of these two years of schooling. As I said, not everybody gets the WACE because there are certain requirements that need to be met. However, all students will get the WASA, which stands for the West Australian Statement of Student Achievement. And that's the piece of paper that it, look, that, that it looks like. And you can see there's lots of um, lists on there and what that is, is a record of all the achievements for a student in their senior secondary years of schooling, which actually starts in year 10, but at Kent Street, we start ours in year 11. So every single achievement of every course, every certificate of qualification or endorsed program are actually listed on that piece of paper, which every student will receive. However, as I said earlier, the waste is not gifted to students, it actually needs to be earned. And in order to earn that, we need to know and be um, totally over around the requirements for waste. The very first one of those is that students need to be uh, in a pathway or on a pathway. That pathway is either an ATAR pathway or a general pathway. And sometimes we call the general pathway VEC pathway. There needs to be a breadth and depth of study demonstrated. Breadth means broad and depth means deep. So the courses that the students do in year 11 can come from different course units, but in year 12, the students need to focus on six courses because in year 12, the courses come as combined, uh, whereas in year 11, they can be split at the end of semester one should progress not be satisfactory. 
The next requirement is that the students need to achieve a certain standard and that comes from the grades. And we'll talk about the minimum standard shortly. And also, the demonstration of literacy and numeracy needs to be achieved. So they are the points that need to be uh, met in order to achieve the West Australian Certificate of Education. So let's have a look at each of those in turn. The pathway is a minimum requirement to complete at least five courses, with at least four of those being used to calculate the ATAR. I'm not going to talk about ATAR at this, uh, at this um, information session, that will come later. The general pathway is a minimum requirement to, com uh, to complete at least five general courses and or a certificate qualification. So that's the very first requirement um, for meeting the WACE. The other one is talks about breadth and depth. So the courses um, the, the students study are designed by the Schools Curriculum and Standards Authority. In Year 11, the course is made up of two units, Unit 1 and Unit 2. Unit 1 is typically studied in Semester 1 and Unit 2 in Semester 2. A student can choose to change to Unit 2 of a different course at the end of Semester 1 should progress in the original course not be satisfactory or they've had a change of pathway. In Year 12, Units 3 and 4, they are studied together and that, that constitutes the depth of study. So it also talks about in breadth and depth, the students must complete at least 20 course units or equivalent. The equivalence comes from the certificate qualifications. As demonstrated in the table on the right, a certificate 1, 2, 3 and 4 have got those units of equivalence. Endorsed programs also come under equivalence and the maximum number of units that come from equivalence can only be eight. So you can see if a student completes two certificate twos, then they have their four, uh, four unit equivalents from each certificate qualification, which gives them a maximum of eight. So breadth and depth is the completion of at least 20 course units or equivalent. Um, and um, of those, English actually has to be part of that um, breadth and depth. Students cannot avoid doing English in both Year 11 and Year 12 because at the end of the day, they must have achieved some grade in four units of English. The breadth and depth, there's the further elaboration of that. In Year 12, the student must complete a, unit, a course from List A and List B. List A is English, so we don't really need to keep an eye on that, but List B is this Maths, Science and Technologies, and that's the area excuse me, that some students may avoid, uh, so we need to make sure that the student meets that requirement. It is in fact the Year 12 requirement, however it would be silly to do um, no year, List B in Year 11 and then have to pick up a List B in Year 12. So also the uh, requirement there is that the student cannot do um, 12 units in year 11 and then 8 in year 12 because there's a minimum requirement there that 10 must be done at year 12 level. The achievement standard, that's where we come with the grades. So a student can actually complete the 20 course units and achieve grades of D and E because a grade signifies completion. However, the minimum standard means that the students need to have that minimum standard and of those 20 course units, 14 must be assessed at a grade of C or better. And at least six of those need to be completed in year 12, or sorry, achieved in year 12. What that means is that a student can't just do a really, really good year 11 and get 12 course units of C or better and then put out the anchor and only get two in year 12 because the requirement is that it has to be a consistent effort from the student over the two years of their secondary schooling. So six units um, at year 12 level must be assessed at a grade of C or better. The final requirement for waste achievement is literacy and numeracy. And it's demonstrated as stated on the screen. There is a misunderstanding still that students believe that they must pass English to demonstrate literacy. That is in fact not true. 
They only ma ma they manage to demonstrate literacy through the completion of NAPLAN or ULNA. So why does it matter if you get a D for English? As long as it's a grade, as long as it's studied, that's met that requirement. So passing English is not a requirement for literacy and numeracy. The ULNA or, NAP or, NAP <coughs> excuse me, or NAPLAN makes that requirement. <coughs> excuse me. So looking at some of the aspects of uh, year 11 studies, I've got a, char excuse me, a chart here that shows different combinations of courses and certificates that a student in ATAR or general pathways can um, uh, make up their uh, study schedule. And at the right hand side of that table you can see how many unit equivalents um, each of those courses uh, results in. So you can see that at the end of year 12, with a full course in year 11 and year 12, the students will have completed 24 course units, which makes them pretty safe when it comes to meeting that first requirement, which was at least 20. So, the timetable construction. The timetable was based on the results of students' counselling at the end of um, year 10. Once those choices were uh, entered, the timetable was constructed. So based on those choices, the timetable is what it is. So if a student wants to um, change a course, it may or may not be possible, depending upon what's available at that time. So it's really important that your young person um, makes an absolute, um, heads down, um, makes a, a reasonable effort at the course that they're doing because changing it may not be possible due to timetable constraints. Okay, so the timetable is made up of two sets of um, study types basically, courses or certificate qualifications. The courses are all delivered at school and they're studied four times a week. The certificate, quali for quali certificate qualifications are either delivered on site or off site in a one day a week program and Mr Dowd will talk about that later in the presentation. And uh, you may have seen your child's timetable where they've got blanks on it. This one is an example. The student is doing hospitality certificate two. That particular certificate requires a student to have two hours of time to prepare food. So what's happened there is the timetable has them scheduled for period five on Friday, but in order to create a double period or two hours straight, that period five has been moved to Thursday before school. So that gives us the flexibility for the students to be able to meet the requirements of the certificate qualification. So on Friday, this particular person is, is within their rights to leave the school at the end of period four because their day is done. However, the day before, they must show up at school at eight o'clock. The same um, structure is managed for the certificate two in engineering pathways. Here, they stay late on Tuesday and they start late on Wednesday. And that's how we've managed to incorporate certificate qualifications on site so that the time affected is uh, given due consideration. So, each student through their courses and through study programs should have those three documents. The course syllabus, the course outline and the assessment outline. Each of these documents are loaded on sector under the various courses that your child is studying. It's really important that the course syllabus becomes a document that's well used over the course of the year. And we ask you as the parents and guardians of the year 11 student to actually keep in mind that particular advice because it's the syllabus that determines the assessment um, content. The textbook is written by third parties, so the textbook doesn't determine what's in, what should be taught, it's the syllabus. The course outline uh, gives a breakdown of, uh, of the uh, course over the course of um, two semesters, and the assessment outline should have days and weeks and times when assessments are due. During um, the study times, the students were actually given a calendar on which to put their assessments. And it would be really helpful if you could monitor that with them to make sure that they don't 
fall behind in their work that needs to be submitted for assessing. Because the assessment policy is quite harsh, but it's realistic. If work is handed in late, there's uh, percentage deductions on the final mark. For example, if an assessment is handed in five days late, that person loses 50% of the value of that achievement. So 80% becomes 40. So what we want is the assessments for our students to actually reflect their skills, knowledge and abilities in a course not how well they manage their time. So it's really important that you keep that in, excuse me, that in mind as you assist your child navigate through your 11 studies. So as far as reporting goes, uh, all the assessments for students are uploaded onto sector and feedback is given by the teachers through sector. So it's really important that you log into sector to see how your child is progressing. In semester one, there will be a report as normal but that report in most courses will simply be a progress grade. Okay, go back here. The semester one report is a progress mark and semester two report gives the final assessment for that course. What that means is, if your child gets a D for semester one in English and then gets their mojo together, in semester two they get a B, then that is recorded as a B for semester one and a B for semester two. On the flip side, if a student achieves an A in semester one as a progress grade and then decides that this is also easy and then doesn't put in the effort required and achieves a C in semester two, then the grade is recorded as a C for semester one and a C for semester two. So it's really important that the difference between progress grades and final grades is pretty clear. So parents as partners, we talk about that a lot. So what we would like is for that to become a reality for your young person, your family and us. So having an idea of the assessment schedule is extremely valuable. Monitor their study time, make sure that they've um, not being distracted, Miss Miller will talk more about that. And know their achievement, which means regular um, access to our sector to make sure that the uh, feedback is received and action is taken to improve that particular achievement. So, coming down to monitoring their study. General courses, people might think that general courses don't need to study, well they do. Every night, Time should be dedicated to reviewing the lessons for the day. In year 12, the year 11, sorry, the general courses in year 12 have a sort of what you could call a waste exam, but it's called an externally set task, and that's done in semester, um, semester one, term two, and that definitely requires study. With ATAR courses, it's an ongoing commitment to study. So at the end of every day, I would imagine that the students would review their lesson for the day. That should be a nightly exercise. There's an example of Cornell Notes template, which students may use or may their own make, um, have their own version of a study a revision sheet. It's really important that, that regular revision happens. The review for the night and then regular revision after that. Because doing year 11 courses, the unit one and unit two together, the examination in semester two will in fact assess material from the syllabus from February through to November. So you can't forget the work that's done in semester one uh, because that's down and dusted. Students need to have that regular review, otherwise their achievement in um, the exam could be impeded because of the recall. So I'll pass over to Miss Miller now who will talk about the 25th period which we happen to have Thursday, period two. Thank you, Ms. Rachel. Thursday, period two is actually what we deem a study skills period. In that period, students are recommended to actually review the week that has just preceded the time they are in Thursday, period two. 
In year 12, we run a university program. In year, year 11, we're trying to discipline the students to become a little bit more self-disciplined. So we would like them to actually review the work they've done for each class in each course each week to use that time to get themselves organised for subsequent lessons to perhaps even engage in doing some research for assigned work. As much as the students come home and tell you things like, oh, we do nothing in that uh, period, that's not in fact the case. At the moment, the students are doing some career investigation work in year 11, but the program changes into year 12. The Thursday period two, or the 25th period as we call it, should be a time when the students are actually reflecting, reviewing, revising and preparing. At different stages during the year, there will be a guest speaker program happening and we'll also have some health and wellbeing activities, particularly towards week nine and 10 of terms one, two and three. So realistically, the 25th period is about preparing for the future. I don't need to work, read that to you, you can read it yourself. We will be having a number of personnel from jobs and skills centres, legal aid and varying organisations come in and speak with the children or the year young people about different opportunities available to them. For off-site study opportunities, I will hand over to Mr Dow, our VET coordinator. Thank you, Ms Dow. Off-site study opportunities. VET external training and workplace learning. Students may be off-site for one to two days for the following. VET delivered in secondary schools, TAFE courses, training with a private training organisation, school-based traineeships or Aboriginal school-based traineeships, or endorsed, authority endorsed workplace learning. All of these contribute to the West Australian Certificate of Education, build and demonstrate skills aligned to specific industries, and cater to the personal interests of individual students. <laughs> Expectations of students in off-site or external vet training. Attending external training or workplace learning is a privilege. Students are to attend every day of scheduled training or endorsed workplace learning. If you are going to be absent, you must inform the school in line with our attendance policies. Um, if you are at workplace learning, you must also inform your employer. Workplace learning students will have attendance monitored regularly by our new work workplace learning coordinator and poor attendance may lead to students being withdrawn from workplace learning. Off-site VET training and workplace learning students uh, will be conducting their training in adult learning environments. The expectations uh, regarding attendance, study and training and conduct differ from those of the school environment. This is a positive in that students will be treated as an adult. However, failure to meet these standards may have negative consequences such as removal from a course or from workplace learning placement. Students who are in external training or workplace learning will be off-site and therefore will have a modified timetable. The example provided here shows a student who is attending off-site training on a Thursday. That student has been um, timetabled with four private study sub, um, periods rather than a subject. And as you can see, they have uh, private study allocated. They will be missing four periods on a Thursday with a single period allocated to state training. What that means is in their private study periods, timetable, um, they must catch up with the work that they did miss whilst attending external training or workplace learning. Students are expected to maintain a record of this in a logbook which has been provided to every student. The logbook looks as such, students are to re record the course uh, that they have missed for the periods that they missed whilst at external training or workplace learning the work that they've actually missed, whether they've completed it, and they must have a teacher check and sign this as well. 
External VEP Training 2024. Opportunities will exist for students to undertake external training courses at TAFE or with a fee for service provider in Year 12. There are 50 plus uh, courses available in a variety of industries and these will be advertised to students in Year 11 in the middle of the year in 2023. Entry standards for the courses um, as a generalisation are a minimum of C grades with good attendance. However, uh, this may be higher for specific courses. The example provided here is a Cert 3 in Aero Skills. Uh, students wanting to get into that course must demonstrate good maths grades and entry into such courses is competitive. Higher level, Cert 4, Fee for Service courses will also be advertised. Certificate 4 courses can be used as alternative entry to university as well. Students are not alone and nor for that matter are parents. Mr Dow, Ms Rachel, myself, our career practitioner, Mr Luke Watson, are all here to help you and help your students. What do you do when there's a problem? Well, what you don't do is keep it to yourself, but I think you already know that because you are an adult. Unfortunately, your students sometimes stew and ruminate on their problems and don't come and seek help as quickly as they ought. But we're there and generally uh, the homeroom teachers will notice that something's going on or another staff member will notice that something's going on and maybe your student has become withdrawn or is struggling or might even be snappy and they're not even at home. So if you're worried about what's happening with your student or even if you would just like to know how they're progressing or how their demeanour is at school because you've noticed that they've become a little bit withdrawn Ring up and ask us, ask me as the senior school um, coordinator to find out what's going on. I'll simply put an email out to other staff, teachers of their courses and say, hey, how's little Johnny going? And teachers always respond and always let me know if they have concerns. This is the support team. As you can see, it's extensive. Any of these people are happy to help you. But again, you simply must ask. This year, in Year 11, there are numerous dates to note and I suggest that you perhaps pause this video and you actually take a screenshot and make sure that you've written those dates down or recorded them somewhere. Now this is where things get a bit tricky and I must admit I had a phone call from one mum yesterday afternoon being very concerned about her particular student because they seem to be struggling with their year 11 studies. Now, we want students to have a work-life balance, but sometimes they're distracted. We want students to be emotionally, mentally and physically at ease with themselves. Sometimes the burdens of study can become too much and often they try and burn the candle at both ends, playing sport, hours and hours of it, playing games, hours and hours of them, and then trying to cram in some study as well. If your student has set themselves a goal, and hopefully they have set themselves a goal to attain waste at the end of what's really only 18 or 19 months, then they need to try and offload some of the distractions. What are the big distractions for students? Research shows some of these things are actually the ones that you need to be concerned about and we certainly are. Gaming. Gaming actually has a really bad name and for good reason and if your student is trying to do an ATAR or dedicated study regimen, it's time to get rid of the gaming or at least start monitoring and managing it. Socialising and partying. Well, students are only 15, 16 and 17. If they get into the partying now, then when they hit 18, when they're legally allowed to party and do some of that extra socialising, the fun's being had and it's uh, not much chop, I guess, from there on in. Work is a big one. Work tends to dictate a lot to these students, but WorkSafe tell us that students shouldn't be working between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So some fast food outlets actually require working till 11 a.m. and sometimes 
other retail industry um, businesses actually want students to be there by 5.30 to start at 6. Well, that's actually against the law, so there's a little heads up. Believe it or not, one of the biggest distractors for students are their parents and their siblings. I'll go back to social media. Facebook, gaming, TikTok's not up there, Snapchat, Instagram. Living your world online is not the same and certainly not as mentally fulfilling or as challenging um, in terms of self-development as living face to face. So if your child is forever with that phone attached to their hand, you might need to look at that. We at school certainly 100% believe in the rule of phones off and away because historically, and I do mean in the last 10 years, phones have been banned pretty much um, for good reason in numerous independent schools, numer numerous private schools and a number of schools interstate. So I hope we follow suit. Unfortunately, the online world can actually have greater um, ramifications than just, well, you're on it too long. It has been directly linked to anxiety. It does play a role in depression. And those of you that are in the mental health and wellbeing field will know that 40% um, of the young people, 16 to 24, will suffer from anxiety, depression, or any of numerous other mental health issues in their young lives. That can be managed and monitored. What do we want for your student? We want them to be healthy and happy. We want them to engage with others. We want them to mini mini minimise, excuse me, their catch-ups. They can be done on the weekend. They shouldn't be working more than three hours after school on a school night. Um, Miss Miller's not making that up. That's what the regulations say from WorkSafe. We really want parties and gatherings to not happen. I know that's probably um, wishful thinking, but they certainly shouldn't be regularly partying and, and attending gatherings. But we do want study buddies to occur. We would really like study forums, um, one friend with another engaging in a physics or a career and enterprise session to nut out what's going on. Study buddy setups have proven to be very successful and are known to be very successful and recommended by numerous organisations um, of the ilk of Elevate and our David Castell and Ellie's Prosper program. What we see here are a couple of young people engaged in some workplace shopping centres or organisations. The almighty work and dollar. Given that your student or our student is actually only 15, 16 and 17, they do have the rest of their lives to work. And as much as we acknowledge and recognise that they dearly love to be able to pay for their driving lessons and the latest and greatest in fashion accessories, as well as the IT and sneaker freaker um, necessary accoutrements, we would prefer that they dedicate more of their time to what's important in life at that age, and that is actually some school-related catch-up. I've already suggested what the minimum hours of work or maximum hours of work are, and I'll allow you, I won't allow you, you can add your own um, uh, suggestion, go and search up WorkSafe Australia and look at, or WorkSafe in WA in actual fact, and check out what the actual recommended hours are. You will probably be very surprised. Believe it or not, families are a bonus, they're a boon, but they're also problematic. If a student is doing a dedicated study regimen, he does not need mum coming in every five minutes or 10 minutes saying, Auntie Mary's coming over in half an hour. What are you doing this weekend? We need to organise a family get together because it's granddad's 60th. Students in this age group will know by the end of term two that it takes 23 minutes to get into the study zone or the flow zone. And in the flow zone, the creative juices have been harnessed. Students' thoughts are starting to actually stream in and they're actually able to get into productive work. If they are interrupted, the flow zone resets and they have to start again. So please refrain from 
interrupting them and do take the phone off them or any other device they have that's not a laptop or a desktop where they need to do the research because they actually need to get quickly into that zone so they can do the assigned homework, task work, assignment work or review. We are very, very lucky. We have got, um, harnessed David Castellanelli, who is a previous Youth Ambassador of the Year. He works on self-development programs between the United States and Western Australia, which is his home. David is probably the biggest factor behind the climbing ATAR, median ATAR, that Kent Street Senior High School has had for the last five years. In Term 3, PROSPER program for Year 11s will start. The PROSPER program for the ATAR students is the program that actually really teaches the students how to best manage themselves so that they can attain their best results moving into second semester exams. We don't do it in the first semester and we simply do that because we want the students to work on their own, under their own steam for semester one work out what the flaws are and then better soak up all the pearls of wisdom that David Castellanelli has for them during term three and we have seen over the past two years since we've been or since we've rejigged the way we've run this program that the results are the proof in the pudding. So parents what have we got for you? Well I thoroughly recommend that you look at this website it has a lot of hints, tips and strategies to help you with your studying student. I think and I hope that um, I've addressed most of your queries. If I haven't, once again, please ask, reach out, we will respond. We have a career practitioner at this school. It's a new role that the Department of Education allocated to numerous senior high schools in the last two years. Mr Luke Watson does a fantastic job in engaging students to actually work out where they're at, what their interests are and which pathways might be suitable for them to journey down. I think it says it for itself. Lots of ways to contact us. Don't be a stranger. Once again, I hope I've addressed your concerns. If not, there are many cogs to this wheel and I'll hand over to Miss Rachel to finish the seminar. I think the final slide is a graphic that um, I think it tries to explain, and I think it explains it fairly well, the uh, cogs. The machine won't work if the cogs are out of sync, the machine won't work if the cogs don't mesh. So we hope that this presentation has given you some insight into the road ahead for your young person who's starting off on year, in year 11. Uh, we know from Tim that uh, options outside of school are many and varied and uh, depending upon the um, interests and strengths of your young person. I'm sure there is something there that they can engage in if school is not offering them the full satisfaction that they, um, that they seek. Ms Miller has highlighted the uh, issues that affect young people and um, uh, stop them from actually achieving their best. So I hope that the uh, presentation has been useful to you. Uh, it will be available on um, upload on Sector uh, and maybe TikTok, I'm not sure. Oh no, sorry, YouTube. Uh, so uh, watch this space and it will be available to you. So I hope you can go through that um, on a regular basis just to remind yourself and your young person of the rules, the requirements for successful completion of first of all year 11 and heading into year 12. So on that note I would like to thank you for um, your interest and um, hopefully we've been of assistance to you. And as Julie said, if um, there are questions that you still have that haven't been answered, do not be a stranger. So on that note, thank you very much and good afternoon.